At the beginning of the 19th century, there was an evangelical wave that took hold of the United States of America, and it was called the Second Great Awakening. It was a time in our nation's history that was marked with great revivals throughout the land. And at one such revival, a pastor was in his tent, and it was hot, and it was summer, and the organist was playing just as I am. And like with many great revivals, they were probably on about the fourth or fifth time of singing <laughs> the fifth verse. <laughs> but as he delivered the altar call, there was a man that had slipped into the back. And once the altar call started, he got up and he slipped out the door of the tent. And the pastor wondered as he saw him leave if possibly he had said something that offended him or if he had said something that convicted his heart. He wasn't sure. But the next night, as the revival service began again, here was this man sitting on the back row again, and this time he had five brand new shirts on the bench beside him. And on this night when the altar call was given, the man came forward bringing those five shirts and he looked at the pastor and he handed them to the pastor and he said, I want to give Jesus these five new shirts. And the pastor looked the man in the eye and he said, thank you, but that's not what Jesus wants. So the man took his shirts and he left. And on the third night of the revival, the man once again found himself on the back row with not only the five new shirts, but five blankets. And at the end of the service, when the altar call was given, the man picked up his five shirts and his five blankets, and he walked down front, and he looked at the pastor, and he handed him the blankets and the shirts, and he says, I want to give these shirts and my five warmest blankets to Jesus. And again, the pastor lovingly looked at him and he said, that's not what Jesus wants. So the man took his blankets and his shirts and he left again. And the next night, the fourth night of the revival, once again we find the man sitting on the back bench in the tent Five shirts on one side, five blankets on the other side. And at the altar call, he gets up and he goes forward with five shirts, five blankets. And he says to the pastor, here, I want to give these shirts and these blankets to Jesus. And as, in addition, I have my five best horses tied <coughs> up outside that I want to give to Jesus. The old pastor looked at the man again and he said... That's not what Jesus wants. <clears throat> so the man left, and the next night was the last night of the revival, and the pastor looked up, and there was the man sitting on the back row once again with nothing, no shirts, no blankets, no sound of horses outside. And when the altar call was given that night, the man came forward, and he looked at the pastor and he said, I've given Jesus everything I have, and that wasn't enough. So now all I can give him is my life. That's all I have left. And the pastor looked him in the eyes and he put his hands on his shoulders and he said, my son, that's all Jesus wants to begin with. Finally, this man realized that all Jesus wanted was his life. Our scripture lesson for this morning on the last Sunday of Epiphany comes from the fifth chapter of Luke, and it begins with verse 1. And in this passage of 11 verses, there's a lot of action going on. There was a great crowd that had gathered to hear Jesus preach. We hear that 
They were pressing in on him, backing him up to the Sea of Galilee. And off to the side, there are three men, Peter, James, and John, who have come in from a night of fishing where they've caught nothing. And they're washing their nets. And it was in that very moment that Jesus spoke and told his first three disciples exactly what it was that he wanted from them. Listen to how Luke tells the story of what Jesus wants from us as well. I'll be reading this morning from the New Living Translation, beginning with verse 1 in chapter 5 of Luke. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. Jesus noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So Jesus sat in the boat and caught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now, go out where it is deeper and let your nets down to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and we didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets again. And this time their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. And a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and he said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. He was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as were the others who were with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. As soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. This is the word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks, Thanks to God. God. This call of the first disciples is one of my favorite stories in the New Testament well, for several reasons. First of all, and I guess probably the most important, is it just shows me how God calls ordinary people. You know, he could have gone to the temple. Jesus could have walked right into the middle of the Sanhedrin and said, all you Pharisees, Sadducees, and Levites, and rulers, come follow me. That's not where he went. He could have walked into Herod's mansion and said, Herod, you and all your family, all your riches, you come follow me. That's not where he went. He went and found three ordinary men <coughs> on the side of the lake who had been fishing all night. And when we first meet Peter and his friends, they're cleaning their equipment because just like you and me, these guys had to work for a living. That's one reason, and the first reason, I love this story so much. Secondly, Jesus caught these guys on a bad night. He didn't kept come calling on them when they were coming into shore with boats full of fish. He kind of to them on a night where their nets had come up empty, where their walls had come crashing down, where their very livelihood had been threatened. And I can only imagine the conversation that must have been going on as these three friends spoke to each other, how they were down in the dumps. Quite honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if their language didn't reflect their disappointment also. And what this tells me is that Jesus meets them right where they are. 
And he immediately understands what they're going through. He knows that if they don't catch fish, they don't eat, they can't support their families, they can't make it in their world. But Jesus allows Peter to speak frankly to him and to show his disbelief and to show that he is not afraid to hear what Peter had to say because Peter says, you know, we've been out there all night fishing and we didn't catch a single thing. But why should I, an experienced fisherman, trust you, an itinerant preacher, to get in my boat and tell me to go out and catch fish? I'm the fisherman, you're not. The focus of the passage is not what Jesus had said in his sermon because we have no idea what Jesus' sermon was that day. It wasn't how the crowd reacted and how many people chose to follow Jesus that day from the crowd because we're not told. The focus of this passage is not on two boatfuls of net filled fish, so many fish that the boats almost sank. <coughs> What the focus of our passage this morning is, is the relationship that Jesus invited Peter, James, and John into it with him that night. The emphasis in the passage is the beginning of a prophetic community created by Jesus to spread the good news, even if it's only evident to those of us who know the rest of the story. I also find some encouragement in the fact that Jesus was not put off by Peter's initial resistance. You know, Jesus said, let's go back out into the deep water. Peter said, I don't know if that's such a good idea. Jesus wasn't put off. Jesus didn't say, fine, I'll go find somebody who will go. We don't have to hide our doubts and our fears from Jesus. Because he knows about them already. Mm -hmm. We think we're being sly and sneaky and hiding all of our fears and our doubts and all the things we don't think he knows about. But he does. Yes. I'm encouraged by the fact that Jesus was not offended by Peter's sinfulness or Peter's acknowledgement that he is not worthy to even be in the presence of the Master. I believe that what that tells us is that we don't have to hide our true opinion of ourselves from Jesus either. Because Jesus knows who we are. He created us. He knit us together in our mother's womb before we were ever, ever breathing out on our own. In his call to Peter, Jesus appears, to me at least, to be more than simply affirming Peter and saying, you know, buck up, little buddy. You're okay. You're not so bad. What I think he's saying is stop being afraid. We've got work to do. And I think the turning point in this story, just as it is in all of our lives, is in that small moment in which Peter grants Jesus the authority over his life. And he's willing to do what Jesus wants him to do. Sometimes we're not willing to yield our lives. We want to give a third of our lives or a fourth of our lives. Or maybe if we're feeling really self-righteous, we'll give him half of our lives. Jesus wants our whole life. Yes. The turning point in our story today is when Jesus yielded his entire life to the authority of Jesus Christ. The love and the grace of God that is shown to us through Jesus Christ doesn't stop when we 